Welcome to the Refugee Studies Centre's weekly seminar in forced migration. I'm Matthew Gibney, the Director of the Refugee Studies Centre. And it's a great pleasure to have as our speaker tonight an Oxford colleague of mine for, for many years uh, from Compass, Nick Van Heer. Nick is a senior researcher at Compass and he's been one of the most uh, influential migration scholars of the last 20 years. His work at uh, New Diasporas is extremely widely referenced and was very um, original in its time. Um, he's a long term, uh, a long time expert on forced migration in relation to Sri Lanka. And his work uh, in recent years has importantly emphasized the role of class in migration. Uh, a, a perspective on, uh, on forced migration that has uh, very much been overlooked in uh, recent years until his work came out in particular. His most recent book is Refugia, Radical Solutions to Mass Displacement, which he uh, has published with Robin Cohen. And we're going to hear more about that topic from uh, Nick tonight. I should say that I chose uh, Nick as a speaker deliberately because of this topic, because of his emphasis uh, in that work on radical solutions, what one might call forms of practical utopianism, because I believe those kinds of suggestions and ideas are absolutely essential in our current international environment in relation to forced migrants where opportunities for asylum are diminishing it seems every day so i'm very much looking forward to his talk which which is going to be on the topic of reflecting on refugee but just before i hand over to him uh just a couple of formalities nick will speak for about 35 minutes and we'll have around 20 minutes or so for questions afterwards. Questions can be uh, submitted through the Q&A button at the bottom of uh, your screen. You write them out, submit them, and then I read them out. Uh, and you can submit questions at any time during the talk and, uh, and after the talk as well. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to Nick now for his talk. Okay, thanks, uh, Matt, um, and good to be back. As they say, I was at Refugee Studies in the 1990s. <clears throat> uh, is the screen working and all that? I hope so. Can I just get confirmation that uh, we're okay on that front? Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, so... Thanks, Matt, once again, for your, your kind introduction. So, refugee is an idea that, um, as uh, Matt said, that my colleague, uh, my good colleague, Robin Cohen and I came up with in the latter part of 2015, um, which we've subsequently developed uh, in a number of presentations that we've made in various parts of the world. I think something like 25 presentations uh, a number of journal articles and uh, blogs. And finally, a book, this book, Refugia, published by uh, Routledge, and which came out earlier this year. And the book um, elaborates our uh, ideas, to, uh, refines them a bit, brings a bit more evidence in, and perhaps most importantly, tries to address or incorporate uh, some of the many critiques of uh, the idea of refugee <clears throat> that we've uh, 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 encountered. I'm trying to get a full image, but I can't at the moment. Um, so how did this uh, project start or this idea start? Well, like many others, we watched appalled and frustrated in 2015-16 uh, at the scenes of uh, refugees and other people on the move of all ages, people in wheelchairs, people in sandals, tramping through the mud 
in uh, as they pass through Turkey, Greece, uh, the Balkans, and on to other parts of Europe. And later there were, of course, similar scenes unfolding, for example, on the Myanmar-Bangladesh border, the huge Rohingya uh, exodus, the debacle in uh, Venezuela and the mass exodus from Venezuela, the, the Central American caravan with the, those shameful scenes on the US border, the Libyan uh, migration detention centers with the terrible things happening in those, the, the pathetic semi-deflated dinghies, rubber dinghies that we saw attempting to cross the Mediterranean, the overcrowded camps in Greece and elsewhere, and many other disturbing uh, scenes, a whole litany of disturbing scenes that we saw. And so as the, one of the outcomes of that uh, period of uh, uh, accentuated uh, mass displacement, you will recall, was a whole set of proposals, of summits and then proposals um, seeking to address the challenge of uh, mass uh, displacement um, that we saw daily on our, our TV screens. And I suppose there were two sets of sources of these proposals. They range from ideas uh, broadly that came from within the refugee and migration scene or arena or the commentariat, refugee commentariat, and a kind of inside thread. I'm thinking of um, Alex Betts and Paul Collier's book on uh, trying to mend the broken uh, refugee system and the book, The Ark of Protection by Alex Alinikov, himself a former UNHCR, UNHCR staffer and his uh, colleague, uh, Lia Zamore. Uh, that Ark of Protection came out in 2018 and has come recently come out uh, in hard copy. So there was that thread of what, you, what I'm calling insider uh, perspectives and proposals, but there were also um, uh, a set of more rather more outlandish ideas from a number of well-meaning outsiders who are kind of often well endowed philanthropists. They were sort of um, real estate magnates, uh, tech billionaires, telecom people who made their money out of telecoms and so on, um, architects and, and so on. And uh, a common motif in there in this thread of proposals was the notion of buying, sequestering, or even building islands uh, on which uh, refugees would be accommodated, or designating uh, urban areas as refugee cities or other discrete territories uh, on which to house refugees and, and migrants. Going back to the insider track, as we know, the, the soul searching as a result of this set of mass dis displacements from about two 2015 culminated in the Global Compacts on Refugees and Migrants, uh, adopted late in 2018, and lately the rather more mean spirited uh, EU pact on um, asylum and migration that's just come out. So there were those two sets of proposals and I suppose ours uh, and we reviewed uh, both both tracks if you like both uh, sets of, of proposals um, just to see what were, what was in them and our proposal was perhaps positioned between the two between this insider and outsider threads or tracks if you like in that we attempted and whether we were successful or not is for you to judge to uh, draw on the kind of utopian thinking from the outsider outlandish proposals um, and temper that with an idea that might have some purchase in a reality. And our particular aim was to draw in specifically or to draw on specifically the transnational practices of refugees and migrants um, today. And then another of our uh, approaches, which perhaps was a little bit innovatory, was to deploy what's been called uh, social science fiction. 
uh, as a means to think our ideas uh, through. And it's this genre which I'm going to draw on today to present uh, the idea of uh, refugia. So I'm going to present a modified version of the extended vignette, which you can find in the opening section of our book. And in that vignette, we project forward to the year 2030, by which time uh, the transnational polity refugia has been tentatively established. So now you need to imagine yourself jetting forward to the year 2030, and you'll be maybe a little bit heartened to know that there's been a little bit of pushback against the authoritarian populist regimes that took power in much of the world from the mid 2010s onwards. But all the same, by and large, the world is still subject to authoritarian uh, polities of various kinds. The pushback that has happened has, has come not so much at the, at the national level um, as in uh, large metropolitan centers in both what used to be called the global north and in the former global south. Those terms are no longer used in, uh, by the year 2030, thankfully. Quite often there's a stalemate uh, in what have, been, have come to be known or recognized as tripartite societies. Societies that are part, one part conservative, one part uh, progressive, just to use those terms as a, a shorthand, and the third part, the remainder, are the don't knows, the non-committals, the don't cares. But it's the conservative part, the conservative third or thereabouts, just over a third, uh, that tend to have the edge over the rest enough to maintain their grip on, on power. Authoritarian corona regimes <clears throat> are common, uh, building on the social and political uh, restrictions that were introduced to control uh, the mutations of the virus, uh, the SARS virus that uh, afflicted the world uh, in 2020. Um, and those restrictions, of course, more to the point, control people. Differences between conservatives and progressives are pretty much entrenched and in irreconcilable. And residential separation has grown. It already existed 10 years uh, now, but is now much more entrenched. And so uh, movements like the Wallers have uh, extended the gated communities that once were the preserve of elites to much wider swathes of the population, walling off different, segregating different parts of the population. So in other words, trends that emerged in the first 20 years of the 2000s towards the polarization of cosmopolitans and parochials or anywheres and somewheres in the uh, formulation by uh, David Goodhart, that polarization has um, hardened and is reflected spatially by the division of the world into metropolitan, relatively liberal megacities with progressive uh, administrations, which are often in conflict with the authoritarian national governments in the countries in which they sit. And the power of the latter, of course, is drawn from conservative supporters in the smaller towns and the countryside. Even more seriously, to add to the rather bleak picture, pervasive identity uh, conflicts fueled by ethnic nationalist and religious uh, loyalties and exacerbated by, by uh, climate breakdown and the continuing SARS mutations, the pandemics associated with them. Co these conflicts continue to convulse many parts of the world and insurgents are locked in uh, low level intermittent conflicts that er erupt into full scale war from time to time. And common, con com uh, commentators have come to term this condition as perma-conflict perma and millions of displaced people are on the move as a, as a result. More positively though, there is a positive note. A, uh, a transnational polity called Refugia 
is consolidating itself after a shaky start following the failure of the global compacts on refugees and migration that were meant to regulate and make safe the movement uh, of uh, migrants and refugees. So Refugia grew out of a global socio-political movement of, uh, of, of migrants and refugees against um, unlivable conditions, De declining uh, incomes, COVID or SARS clusters, endemic violence and climate breakdown. In short, the lack of a, of a life worth living. The, this social political, socio-political movement was galvanized by a series of physical movements, which became known as the marches. They're global versions of what we saw in 2015, the movements from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on through Turkey uh, and on into uh, continental Europe. So these 2020 marches from about the mid 2020s included a revival of the Central American caravan. It included Afrique en Marche, which uh, sometimes folded into the Al Sham and Al Shark march, marches in North Africa and uh, West Asia, for, uh, formerly known as the Middle East. <clears throat> uh, the Urals and Caucasus marches, <clears throat> the ASEAN circulation of uh, protest, and the March of the Hua. So a whole set of uh, marches occurring more or less simultaneously around the world in uh, uh, protest at unlivable condi living conditions. <clears throat> As in the movements of 2015 <clears throat> onwards, mobile communities or what could be called a mobile commons to use the uh, notion introduced by uh, Papadopoulos and Sianos uh, were created uh, en route by the marchers, <clears throat> and sometimes these communities had territorial bases which drew on refugee to refugee, migrant to migrant, and citizen to migrant solidarities. And eventually some saw the virtue <clears throat> of linking these refugiums, as they were called, into a wider collectivity that would enhance the solidarity and community of people on the move. So the entity that emerged from this collective initiative, Refugia, was not a new nation state, but rather a new kind of transnational polity, which drew on uh, other kinds of uh, transnational precedents, such as diaspora organizations, uh, transnational political and cultural movements, and even transglobal faith uh, organizations. Refugia is confederal in character, and perhaps the best analogy is with a, a loosely connected archipelago that brings together hundreds of refugee and migrant uh, communities in many territories, um, in places that neighbor conflict, as well as those in more distant countries of settlement. Initially, Refugia is um, organically or spontaneously fashioned, but as it later consolidates as a polity in its own right, it has the power to press for a kind of bargain, a kind of gam a ba a gr grand bargain between richer states and emergent countries, poorer countries that neighbor conflict or unlivable zones, and crucially, refugees themselves. So the constituent territories of refugee are in effect licensed or at least tacitly tolerated by the nation states within whose uh, territories they, they lie. And the collective name for these host nations, host countries has been coined by some refugeeans. They call them somewhere lands. <clears throat> and this is a way of defining places that have encouraged uh, refugee settlement or at least tolerated their, their presence. While not according refugees full citizenship, uh, some of the less authoritarian states of which there are few uh, took an early lead in accommodating one or more refugeeums. 
and local communities, <clears throat> particularly those with substantial populations of migrant heritage and many uh, municipal administrations of progressively run uh, cities, <clears throat> have done likewise, sometimes against the wishes of the authoritarian nation states in which they lie. But even the authoritarian corona states or regimes have come to see refugia as a force to be reckoned with and to be accommodated uh, for pragmatic uh, reasons <clears throat> uh, where possible, particularly in the face of these marches, which I mentioned before. So now in 2030, there are over uh, 300 refugiums worldwide, which are linked into the overarching uh, transnational entity refugia. <clears throat> So what about the governance of this transnational polity that is not a nation state? <clears throat> How is it run? Well, refugia as a whole is governed by a transnational virtual assembly, which is elected by uh, refugians from all the constituent components of the polity, all the refugiums. Um, periodic face-to-face -face assemblies uh, are also convened and in fact, regional versions of these date from 2018-19. There have been a number of these kind of refugee assemblies uh, of refugees, not of uh, people uh, intervening on behalf of refugees, but assemblies of refugees have taken place in recent years. And these are precursors of the refugee assemblies. So these uh, overarching structures represent uh, refugia globally, but at the heart of the transnational polity <clears throat> are constituent assemblies in each refugium that feed into this uh, global representation and, it, and also represent the inter in interests of refugiums to their particular host society and also channel the concerns of the somewhere landers, the host <clears throat> citizens, to uh, refugians. Refugians hold multiple uh, belongings. They can move amongst the different parts of refugia and where negotiated between their refugiums and the somewhere lands, the host states, including those that particip participate in common travel areas like the European Union and ECOWAS in West Africa and so on. And this movement is facilitated by uh, sorry, I unmuted myself by mistake by uh, what's known as the Sesame Pass, uh, which encrypts the entitlements that uh, refugees hold: their their citizenship, their uh, health uh, records, uh, uh, voting rights. Um, uh, kind of passport rights as well. Refugee, refugees may be citizens or recognized residents <clears throat> of the somewhere land states which license their territories. Some refugees <clears throat> live in discrete territories or spaces, while others live side by side with somewhere landers, uh, uh, especially in large metropolitan uh, cities. Where agreements are reached, the latter somewhere land dwelling refugians can opt to move to territorial refugiums if they wish, or maintain a presence in both those refugiums and the somewhere land host society. There's no obligation to, for refugees to affiliate to refugee. They don't have to if they don't want to. They may rather continue to take their chances with the conventional asylum system if they wish, or indeed to return to their homelands if and when conflict um, abates or the unlivable conditions that they've escaped uh, are, are resolved. Interestingly, a considerable number of uh, citizens of somewhere land host societies have become refugees by choice where the local uh, assemblies have accepted their applications. These elective refugees have said that they seek alternative forms of living 
to those in authoritarian regimes that hold sway in much of the, the world. They call themselves side streamers, <clears throat> those who've foregone the, the authoritarian mainstream. So as well as those displaced by conflict and unlivable conditions, refugia uh, attracts the left outs, the dissidents uh, of what has be been dubbed as a neo-illiberalism, just as authoritarian demagogues, you may remember, appealed to and incorporated the left behinds of neoliberal globalization from the 2010s. Against the background of mobility restrictions in most uh, somewhere lands wrought by the persist persistence of SARS uh, uh, pandemic mutations, um, movement uh, within the refugee uh, transnational, trans transnational entity is welcomed by both refugees and former, uh, the former somewhere landers, the side streamers, the dissidents of uh, somewhere lands. So the upshot of all this is that refugees and other people on the move um, are no longer primarily the responsibility of the somewhere land nation state that territorially hosts them, but of a more diffuse entity, refugia. <clears throat> in effect, if you want to frame it in uh, conventional um, refugee talk, uh, in effect, refugia is arguably a fourth durable solution in that regaining effective citizenship, not just citizenship, but effective citizenship or, um, or, or membership of a political community, which is the ultimate object of the conventional three uh, durable solutions of return, local integration, or resettlement in the third country. That effective citizenship or membership is accomplished by becoming a member of the new transnational polity uh, refugia. It's the option of, it's indeed the option of many, given that the three conventional durable solutions are simply not available to them or possible for most uh, displaced people, as was the case in 2020. What about the economy? <clears throat> Refugees' economy uh, builds on the skills of refugians in cultural and creative industries, in education, uh, in digital commerce and services, and is based on the proliferation of various kinds of distance work I'm thinking of design, software development, uh, translation and language services, coding, uh, accountancy, the development and teaching of online courses, much in demand, uh, and other kinds of uh, cognate forms of work. Some employment has been negotiated uh, in uh, special refugee economic zones or development zones located between refugia and somewhere land. So to that extent, the, some, of the, some of the proposals of uh, Betts and Collier uh, uh, have come to fruition. Also by <coughs> mutual agreement, some refugians can work in somewhere lands proper, essentially as migrant workers uh, with agreed proportions of tax revenue uh, negotiated between the two polities. But as refugee becomes more autonomous uh, economically, this kind of dependent, dependent work, uh, which refugee is trying to escape, is indeed uh, diminishing. Refugee as a whole is at the forefront of innovations under the aegis of Global Green, uh, which is a successor to the Green Emergency Deal, which most or two thirds of the world's countries signed up to in the mid 2020s in the face of accelerated climate uh, breakdown. In keeping with Global Green, <clears throat> the stock of refugees in any one refugium is determined by a kind of capacity uh, rating uh, ne negotiated with the somewhere land host society. And this is devised by refugee and uh, digital specialists who are wary of covert control by the technology corporations 
and the calculation, the capacity rating calculation includes such elements as local housing stock, uh, employment and self-employment uh, numbers, ecological impact, uh, demographic indicators, and so on that support the provisions of uh, refugees' progressive outlook. As I've already mentioned, refugees pay some taxes or contributions to the somewhere land nation states within which they live, but most of their taxes go to the wider refugee polity. So there is not double taxation, but a kind of differentiated taxation. A, a portion of that revenue which accrues to refugee provides support for those who choose to stay in their regions of origin, uh, often, which are often less well endowed than those refugeeums uh, located in wealthy somewhere land states. And so there is a mechanism which is somewhat similar to the way in which remittances have been deployed uh, in the previous decades. So in this way, these um, <clears throat> taxes or contributions provide a means of cross subsidy amongst differently endowed parts of refugia. So overall then, refugia at large is not based on uh, ethnicity, nationality or religion. Perma conflict and the experience of the marches has uh, convinced many people on the move of the fallacy of basing communities on narrowly uh, <coughs> defined in identification such as those. Inevitably, some heritage identities uh, still persist in vestigial form, but refugees have been, have of necessity been pressed into collective activity across such affiliations by their experience of forced movement, the hostility of uh, host governments, and the process of building new communities. Differences are respected, but refugees have been driven by their everyday uh, challenges to create a new kind of society or polity that is uh, democratic, self-sustaining and forward-looking and not based on uh, identity politics. And in this regard, they take uh, inspiration from uh, socio-political experiments <clears throat> in direct democracy, uh, gender equality, religious tolerance and so on, which uh, occurred in the late 2010s in places like Rojava in northern Syria, which grew up in the wake of the conflict in Syria from uh, 2011. And indeed, some uh, veterans of the Rojava experiment, if you like, are advisors to uh, refugee. <clears throat> Since refugee has been formed uh, cumulatively and incrementally, the confederal trans uh, transnational polity has been able to experiment with forms of intergovernmental uh, relations and economy to see what works and what uh, does not work. <clears throat> In terms of borders, most of the constituent components of refugia have negotiated a porous border with surrounding host states, the somewhere land states, slowly and incrementally uh, moving goods, information and people between old political borders without disrupting long-held territorial identities. In some cases, mutually accessed uh, public spaces known as interzones, social e ecotones or cross-hatching have uh, arisen, have been developed. And this uh, gradual evolution of consensual cross-locations uh, sort of became necessary when trials of completely open borders uh, triggered outbreaks of violence by xenophobes in authoritarian nation states. So we're not talking about an open border uh, setup. <clears throat> in terms of economy, parts of refugee are at the forefront of post-capitalist uh, global experiments to supplant actually existing capitalism. 
Some have tried out peer-to-peer -peer sharing economies and horizontal forms of sociality, which seek to prefigure a post-capitalist network society and green economy based on the production and distribution of information and knowledge rather than market-based uh, relations. Other parts of refugee, though, go along with more conventional capitalism, though of a kind of social democratic uh, welfare, welfareist kind, unlike the neoliberal and authoritarian variants of capitalism that still obtain in many somewhere lands. <clears throat> Refugia has also become of interest to those engaged in social research, uh, which might be of interest to some in the audience uh, today. Given the continuing closure of many societies in the face of SARS uh, mutations, continuing pandemics, the prospect of face-to-face -face social research has diminished. But partly for reasons of self-interest, <clears throat> Refugia is more open to in-person social research than many somewhere lands, <clears throat> which have banned uh, field research out of a combination of suspicion of such research, uh, pandemic control imperatives, and at least among countries of the former global south, weariness of saviorism. <clears throat> Refugees' relatively welcoming stance has nevertheless proved uh, double-edged in that at times the incursion of social researchers has become excessive since they have nowhere else to go to do their, their field research. Accordingly, the uh, Refugee Research Ethics Council, there is such a body, has had to tighten its criteria from time to time to manage the entry of researchers. So in some, refugee is a pragmatic arrangement. Uh, it's a kind of secession by mutual agreement. And it's this that uh, may be the most difficult aspect for many people to swallow, but bear in mind that uh, many societies are already de facto segregated. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> for their part, authoritarian states see it as in their interest to shuffle off the issue of displacement to the displaced themselves. And that's the classic customary neoliberal uh, cost avoiding uh, tactic that um, uh, we, we are all familiar with. While the displaced and those uh, seeking an alternative to authoritarian, authoritarianism relish the prospect of a self-managed new society that they create by and for themselves. <clears throat> As refugeeans uh, readily concede, they certainly don't currently live in a utopia, but this has not prevented them from taking on utopian thinking, from dreaming utopian dreams, and trying to create a better future for themselves and for their children. <clears throat> so I'll finish there, but I just make, would like to make one last uh, observation. Uh, to those who take this piece of social science fiction to be utterly fanciful, I simply ask, is expecting nation states, particularly the current bunch of increasingly authoritarian regimes, is expecting nation states to do the right thing by refugees and people on the move any less of a fantasy than refugee, and I think it is not. At least with our suggestion, and it is just that, a suggestion, people get to the chance to craft their own community and society, even if they fail to get exactly what they want, rather than forlornly appealing to the state to do something with little prospect of anything meaningful happening. Thank you. Thanks, Nick.